This is quite unusual, right? We have a timer in front of us. Yeah. And so we're very time conscious here. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm still trying to wake up, so um, I think this is the best coffee of the day. Femi. Yes, sir. So good to be sitting yeah, next to you. Can I just first of all congratulate you on yesterday? Last night was the Thank business. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank was, you. Thank you. He was extraordinary with the rest of the ensemble as well. Thank you very much, Femi. Yeah. Thank you. So, Femi, um, let me start by letting it known to everyone here that I'm going to be hating today. Oh. You know why? Because um, you beat me to the number one thing on my bucket list, which is to have traveled across the continent and have visited every single African country. And when I was invited to be on this panel, I was like, hey, so this guy actually fulfilled this dream. Like, this is incredible. So Femi, um, let me start by trying to understand what shaped you, what made you an African, because here's the, here's the thing, right? You were born in London. Hammersmith. You grew up in Ileife. You're a campus boy. Your dad was a lecturer. So you spent your formative years in Nigeria. So mm -hmm. I reckon in Nigeria, you were made to understand that you are Nigerian and Yoruba. Absolutely. And then you go, and you, go, you go to the UK, you go back to the UK. Uh, I'm saying this because I'm going somewhere here. Where's the re when do you have that realization that you are African? Um, I think, first and foremost, the idea of going to Nigeria and going to Africa for the first time was rather daunting in the sense that we weren't prepared for it. I, I was just about to embark on my first year in secondary school, right? And my mum and dad, and, and, and this is me and my siblings, I've got four other siblings, were told we were going on holiday. And um, I wasn't prepared for the holiday bit because I was just about to, I mean, out of all the children, I felt rather imposed upon because I was just about to start the most remarkable phase of my formative education here. And I'd chosen the school. I wanted to go to Holloway Boys. It's where Charlie George went, who plays for Arsenal. You know, I was just so crestfallen at the thought of this sudden holiday and that break in, uh, in, a, in, 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 in that potential transition. Um, but then we got on the boat. <laughs> and back in the day, in the 70s, uh, people flew from England to Nigeria or wherever your home country was. But you flew if you were wealthy. Um, and most West Africans going back to Nigeria after, after years of being students in London, my parents that is, would, would actually sail. And you will sail from Southampton or Liverpool. And so the idea of going on this cruise to our holiday excited me uh, and my brothers and sisters. And we then got on this boat, which took 14 days uh, to get to Lagos. But the most exciting thing, because this is the, here's, here's coming to the number of the question which you asked. Up to that point, I was very much a full-blown British kid. I had a Cockney accent. I talked a bit like that. Do you know what I mean? You know, that's how I spoke. And then we started stopping off on the west coast of Africa, these wonderful exotic countries, in my opinion, they were exotic. I'd never seen so many black people literally invested in one place. And the first of those places was Sierra Leone. Um, and I remember getting really giddy. And my mother, who is so wise, and she had prepared all of us for this trip, she kept on saying, to, you're going to know exactly why you're an African today. You know, all these people that you're seeing, they're your uncles, your aunties, your brothers, and your sisters. And that excited us. And so Sierra Leone, Liberia, you know, Ghana, and then finally Nigeria. And when we got to Apapa, there was a welcoming party, like ancestral welcoming party. There were hundreds of people. I think at that point, when we literally stepped off the boat, MV Oriel, onto the Apapa docks, that's when I knew I was African. Hmm. And I was only 11. <laughs> wow. So, uh, 
answering your question. So uh, that means you started the journey. That's yes. where it all yeah. began. Literally. A seed was planted. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward um, seven years ago, you now decide uh, yes. to embark on this adventure. Now, the reason for that being yeah. that I just reeled off four countries, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Ghana, and Nigeria. No, hold your thoughts there. So right, you, okay. you, had, you, you visited, <laughs> did you feel like you had immersed yourself in the culture or in those respective places? Or? No, not at all. You've got to understand that for a lot of us who have been on cruises, we know that that moment where you dock in a country, it's just a seminal moment of maybe a few hours. You never get to invest. You probably will get driven to maybe a fancy restaurant, you know, further in town, but you never get to know the people. I was a child. All I saw, I was so giddy about seeing my people, you know, saw dock workers, seeing sailors who are black, you know, you don't hear about that in, in the fable books, you know, in the Eeps and Aesop fables and all whatnot. So that excited me. However, going now back to your question, 2015, when I made that mad idea, or when I conceived the mad idea, um, I was doing a job for a company called Complicite, which is a, one of uh, UK's most avant-garde theatre companies. I was playing, in this play called Lion Boy, I was playing a lion tamer from Morocco. His name was Mokumu, Mokumu. And um, it was such a big sh uh, play that producers were inviting the producers to come and launch the play in their city. So it took us all over the world, including Broadway. Uh, but I was now visiting Africa for the first time in a production, which is South Africa. And as we all know, South Africa is landlocked with a heaven a lot of other African countries. So I had a quiet word with my producer. I said, you know the day that we have to fly back to England, can I stay? Because in my head, I was thinking, I would love to visit all those beautiful Southern African countries, which I've read about, and who everyone in the UK was coming to me, interviews, Whenever anything, I was the go-to person on for African that's, culture. That's kind of the cliche, right? Yeah, the See, cliche. Oh, you're from Africa. Exactly. There's something happening in Rwanda. These yeah. are go-to guys. Sudan, yeah. So having guy. led a company, an African theatre company in the UK for 14 years, I was the go-to specialist for Africa. And I felt like a fraud. I felt incredibly insulted when they came. But internally for me, I felt like a fraud. Like I didn't know my continent. I only knew Africa, um, I only knew Nigeria, I knew Ghana, I knew the other countries, a few neighboring countries, but I really didn't know the rest of my continent. And so when that job came along, I just thought it would be an ample opportunity to start this odyssey of knowing my continent properly. So if I go back to the UK now, I can talk like a chief with authority. Uh -huh. What do you want to ask me? Mm? As, an as an African. As an African, and I can actually imbue myself, you know, my interiority or, and knowledge of those places that I've been to. I can actually, I can speak with quite good clarity. So you're in South Africa, mm -hmm. and then you decide to embark on this adventure. Yeah, so I was in my dressing room. That's what it was. It was the first day in my dressing room, and I had quite a few Southern African um, service providers from the theater. This is the Baxter Theater in Cape Town. Um, and they came from all over Af uh, Southern Africa. We had a Mozambican, we had a Botswanian, we had a Namibian, we, everyone, everyone from different, it was like a pan-South pan African called a convention in that theater. And they were selling their countries to me. And I went, well, I definitely have to do this road trip at the end of this gig. And that's how it all started. And by the time it was two weeks, after, two weeks after the closure of the play, I had visited 14 countries. And I then said to myself, well, I might as well just continue until I do all 54. But I then set myself a limit. I said, a deadline. I said, I've got to do this before I hit 60, which is the 31st of October, 2022. And so I finished my last trip about two weeks before my 60th birthday. Wow. Wow. Incredible. So let's come to the practicalities of this trip. So I guess you have a dual nationality, Nigerian, British. It didn't right? help. <laughs> it, both didn't help? It didn't, it didn't help having dual nationality. Now that I've done it, I now know the perils 
that one has if you hold a British passport traveling through Africa. I also know the perils and the insecurities that some countries have if you're holding a Nigerian passport. Wow. I know all of that. So when I say it, does, it didn't help, I had double indemnity. <laughs> so, um, but we can, we can speak to that later. So uh, um, you were spontaneous, but at the same time, you have to plan your trip, right? Did yeah. you have like local fixers, no. go-to people? No. Did and I you had no get funding. a lonely planet? Were you no. doing research? No, 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 no. So one of, the, one of the key things that I wanted to achieve is I wanted to explore Africa as an African and see how much of Africa will accept me as the African that I thought that I was. And that meant I needed no handouts, I needed no aids, I didn't want to know any friend or family member in any of the countries I was going to. I wanted to busk it. I basically wanted to, to be a journeyman. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And what was your mission statement? My mission statement was um, for every country that I went to that I had to spend more than 30 minutes, I had to gather evidence of maybe three or five uh, how can I put it, corroborative evidence that will, which will be undisputed in the future. When I die and I go and they say, your father went to Africa, eh, go and produce the evidence. <laughs> so I had to pick up a newspaper, I had to have the currency, I had to take pictures against backgrounds, iconic backgrounds, I had to engage in discourse with an indigen, I had to, what else? So there were some far-fetching things, not having a haircut wasn't far-fetched. Okay. I made sure I had a haircut in at least 30 countries wow. with photographs. Um, How was that experience? It was great. I, when I, the, the, the most bizarre one was in Kinshasa when um, I was walking along the road that led you to the GGM, which is the Director General of Migration, and I had to go and get a, a kind of proof that I've been in town legally before I leave. And I saw this guy, I call him Max, Right, because they, he's, 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 he had this slogan across his the mirror that I had to look into, which said D Max. So I call him Max. I, it's the name I've given him. Right, this guy was under an avocado tree <laughs> along this major highway. Right, this is in public. So there's the curb. There's the road. There's the avocado tree, and there's the barber chair right there, and. I just, and there were people queuing to have their haircuts. Wow. And I thought I'd just join it because it's such a unique experience. I've never had my haircut in public, in full view. People were horning, going, give him a Ronaldo, you know, you know, like different hairstyles that you can think of, you know. So um, that was bizarre. And I was next in line to a police chief who was having his haircut. And, you know, with our upbringing, we got to be quite uh, polite and very, when you see your elder or anyone in uniform. So I just kept on saying, because they speak French out there and I don't speak French. So I just kept on going, uh, bonsoir, oh, bonjour. Uh, you know, literally trying to, I was aping respect as opposed to literally doing it the right way. And he just said, you can speak English to me. <laughs> he called you out. Uh, you say you're a very polite man, very polite. We don't greet each other in the Congo, <laughs> you know. Um, that was a remarkable experience. It was really lovely, yeah. What was your preferred mode of transport? Bush taxis, okay. yeah, and keke. So you would Marawas. Just, How do you identify the Never got packs? a taxi, never ever. I never got a ta into a taxi, conventional taxi because of the language barrier and because I just knew that I'll be cocooned and I'll be even more found out than whatever, yeah. So it was safer to get into a bush taxi and listen. And one of the writers, uh, I think it was Jennifer, who said something about, you know, you, you go into countries and you've got to listen to the people. That is so true. It's a bit like sitting at the back of a bush taxi and just hearing the language and, and absorbing the codes so that you can then ape them, emulate, and pass through as, as just 
an honourable uh, citizen of Africa. <laughs> That's where your work. acting skills come to play. Yeah? yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Wow. And was there a dress code? Like, how did you I ensure always, you fitted in? I dressed. I was always. Actually, that's a lie because What's you're going to see outfit? some pictures. Jalabia. Sometimes, you know, in North Africa, when I was I was in a jalabia, uh, although I don't think I was caught in, on camera in them. But but it's not so much the dress code; it's how you your deportment, your carriage. And I saw you when we met earlier. You said you smell nice. I don't wear colognes when I'm traveling because they smell, as in our people, they will smell where you're from, so to speak, and you become quite vulnerable. Someone's laughing. You recognize that, right? <laughs> they smell you. So they see how you perspire. You know, they see how you sweat. You know, a real African does not sweat. Under the most, the hottest sun, they do not sweat. And then when they see you, you're bringing out your, you're swapping your forehead every second. They go, ah, this one is not one of us. <laughs> it's like a magnet. Yeah. So I try to, um, yeah, I, I, I do, I, I dress down. Quite a lot, and, and no I one would wear. You out. No, um, in where was it? I was. I got in Ethiopia. I got a bit paranoid because everyone was calling me taxi, but actually they weren't calling me taxi. They were just asking if I wanted one. Taxi, taxi. I would be walking and every ta taxi, and I was going, "Why are they calling me taxi?" Um, so that's the call out because you, you you kind of respond in a way that I don't need a taxi or my name's not taxi, you know. Um, so, so there's that. And there's also um, the best one is when you hear, I think this applies to Nigeria as well, when you hear a hiss or a uh, is. Mm. Hello. And you respond. <laughs> when you respond, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, avoid eye contact. Now, come on, guys. This is like a universal thing. You, avoid, avoid eye contact. You know, what, you, you know, with tunnel vision. Sir. Tunnel vision. So that's when you're coming out of the airport. Always tunnel vision. Confidence. You know, walking straight. So you know where you're going, even though you have no idea. You know, I know <laughs> you just keep on walking straight. Straight out, <laughs> and you keep on, when you get to the car park, you keep on walking through the car park as if there's a car waiting for you. <laughs> Brilliant, I did that a lot. I did that a lot. I know safety is a major issue, you know, a lot mm. of people are concerned. I remember when I traveled by road from Lagos to Mali mm. and all the checkpoints and even the border stops, you know, it can be very exhausting, you mm. know, when um, immigration officials try to make a point, you know, they sit on your passport, they withhold the passports, and then obviously the real threat of terror of being killed, you know, on the road or being attacked. Because why I'm bringing this up is a lot of people that I meet um, in Nigeria especially, they always, when I tell them, you need to travel and see West Africa at least, you have an ECOWAS passport, you don't need a visa. They always bring the issue up of safety. How was that? Was that a concern? Was that something that was looming in the background? One of, one of the byproducts of having a mission statement to travel anywhere in the world that you've never been to is, is understanding that there will be moments of insecurity and there will be moments where your intuition will be challenged. I'm not going to lie. I, I was faced with several encounters which are quite scary to recount, actually. Um, and I've written about them. And I'm actually uh, conflicted at the moment as to whether I should include them in the books, because the- Why so? Sorry? I said, why so? Because the other thing that I didn't share with you at the beginning, why I wanted to embark on this mission, is because I wanted to redress some of the, some of the myths and the tropes of Africa. Um, we can talk about the daredevils and we can talk about the, the troubles and the securities and the fears and the anxieties, but there's a lot about Africa that needs to be celebrated. I feel that Africa is one of the coolest planets on the earth, you know, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, it's a great thing about Ake is that it brings a lot of Africans from all over uh, together. Um, I met a Sudanese young lady last night uh, 
I've never met a Su Sudanese person in, in Nigeria before. Aki has invited her over. And I recall going to Sudan, Khartoum, South Sudan, Juba, and, and Sudan, Khartoum. And of course, the byproduct of that visit is I've been banned from entering United States. Um, soon after, I was supposed to go on a cruise for my 60th birthday, um, and I couldn't fly into Fort Lauderdale because um, home security, Homeland Securities have ticked off six countries, I think, that you need to really prove why you were there. And I visited four within, within a week, I think. Wow. So, um, so, so they taught you were a recruiter of sorts. Yeah, and, and these are places that I've been to that I was the most, I felt the most safest, I, it, it, incredibly safe. You know, if you're in Somaliland and you're in a car heading to Mogadishu, you're telling people via WhatsApp, your friends at home, are you mad? What are you doing? Eh? You're going to Mogadishu. What do you want there? And I'm going, I'm going to explore how my brothers and sisters live in a place where the world thinks is a, is a cesspit of sin and vice and you know, everyone who wears sandals is a terrorist. I, I, and I want to go and find out why. That is why I'm, you know, that is why I'm going. And I've been to these places, and of course there are pockets of fear and pockets of, you know, you, you dare not go there because if you do, you are putting your life at risk, but it depends on what time you go. And when, at the most civil places, Sudan is the most, Khartoum is one of the most civilized societies that I've ever entered in, in Africa. You know, the architecture, the, the, the civility of the people, the graciousness and the generosity and the way in which they embrace you, whether you're black, brown, or green, or yellow. Remarkable. And I want to write about that as opposed to, you know, the things that I know um, if you put in the book, you know, you're perpetrating the myth, you know. Um, but those things, are, you know, the book isn't supposed to be a rose-tinted sort of cauldron of how perfect Africa is. There are moments, like on, you're on the road to um, Bamenda in Cameroon and you see a roadblock and you think it's just a police checkpoint, but actually, you know, they're Amazonians who are trying to protect their land and they want to literally investigate who you are in the car. That could be quite scary, you know? And there are moments like, um, for example, Border, point, border post where I was asked to strip naked, you know, down to my underpants because they wanted to know whether I was smuggling in currency. Where was this? Ivory Coast. Can I read it? Yes, please. Would you like to hear about that moment? Yes, please. All right. Uh, what do I do? This is my road trip from... Um, from... Festac town to Abidjan, which meant that I had to drive in a bush taxi from Lagos to Kutono, from Kutono to Lome, from Lome to Ghana, uh, Accra, Tokoradi, and then Abidjan. Now I'm gonna have to find it because I don't think I've earmarked it. Um, did why, it take why, you to you know, while there? I'm looking for yeah, the page, yeah. could you ask someone to tell you the name of five African countries, and then I'll ask them the next question. Okay, who wants to go? Five African countries. Oh, she will answer. And they've got to do it trippingly upon the tongue. They, okay. they can't be thinking about it. Algeria, Morocco, Sudan, Mali, Mauritania... Somalia, I think Western Sahara should be recognized as a country as well, so there's that. Okay, did you say five? Yes. Did you say five just now? Can you, can you repeat those five again so that everyone can hear? Okay, I'm just going to say new ones because they just roll off my tongue. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Mauritania, Algeria, Egypt, Somaliland, Sudan, I'll add in Kenya for effect. That was wonderful. No, you haven't finished the okay. second exercise now. 
is for you to name the capitals. The capital city of Mauritania is Nakumat. Sorry, I struggle to pronounce if I'm not looking. Of Algeria is Algiers. You should know that I'm a travel writer at this yes. stage. Um, the capital, what did I mention? <laughs> Somalia is Mogadishu. If it's Somalia, interrogation. Um, Egypt? Egypt is Cairo. Kenya is Nairobi. Is that all five? That, yeah. Uh, Brilliant. That was fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm really afraid now to repeat that exercise because they now are getting out their phones. <laughs> you don't have internet here. How long did it take you to make it to uh, Cote d'Ivoire? Was it a straight trip? It was two and a half days. So you stopped in where, Ghana? Along the way or The only Togo? place I, st I had a sleepover in two places and they were both in Ghana. Okay. All right, so the place, the so first place was Accra, yeah? And the second place was Takarodi, which is literally on the border. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So here's the thing. The driver that we booked from Nigeria said that he could make the journey to Abidjan in a day and a half. You fell for that. I fell I for fell, that as I well. I fell for it big time. <laughs> so we reached Ghana, so we reached Ghana at six o'clock in the evening. There was no way. I mean, he did well. There was no way. There was absolutely no way we were gonna get to Abidjan on the same day. So guess what happened? I had to stay in a place called Kaneshe. Who, is there any Ghanaians here? Do you know Kaneshe? Yeah, Kaneshe. And then I slept there, and then the following day, I got into another bush taxi to Takarodi and had to sleep there. So I'm going to read what happened to me in Ghana on that trip, because I know where that page is. So here we go. <laughs> Excellent. This is wonderful. The main commercial road running through Osu is Accra's answer to London's Oxford Street. And if by sheer coincidence, the street sign on the corner of 8th lane welcomes me to Oxford Street, then I am laughing. And it does. Very cosmopolitan makeup indeed with Western style fast food joints, bars and pubs. Quissy mentioned Frankie's food and rooms on the same stretch or alternatively the Republic Bar and Grill above it. I'm a good 10 minute walk from both of them and I'm dying for the loo. So I cross the road and nip into KFC. You know there's a KFC there. <laughs> on my way out, I asked the guard by the door journey time between Osu and Kaneshi. He reckons rush hour a good two hours, or off peak three quarters max. And then I weigh up the importance between an early night in a nearby hotel miles away from city limits or the inconvenience of immediately locating Kaneshi. I do require a head start in the morning to Ghana, Ivory Coast border. Within minutes, I'm on a moving trotro. Trotro, sprinting bus, sees interactive, I like this, right, to Kaneshi. The driver heads out of Osu, weaving through traffic on official and graphic roads respectively. I have no idea where on the map of Accra we are traveling though, but I take note of streets and road names. I am hoping as usual for a guiding angel to bail me out. To date, they tend to sit right next to me or hover above my shoulder. I am the lone passenger at the back of the trotro, and in desperate need for a sympathetic ear, I lean forward and try to speak to a bunch of laborers who, at that specific point, the bus stops and they depart. I lean forward to my right and I ask the woman if there are anywhere near Kaneshi Motor Park where I can stay for the night. She says, getting off at Kaneshi Market is a few yards from the park and it's the last bus stop and I was bound to find something there. She offers to take me to the exact spot where cars depart for Abidjan. The driver overhears our conversation and advises me against traveling out tonight. The intention is to find a hotel, bed and breakfast, anywhere offering a decent pillow for the evening. I'll travel in the morning and I'll reassure them both that Angel Kaneshi is the real name between Abba and Abba 
and adds that if I was to head out to Ivory Coast in the morning, it would be wise to split the journey across another two days, stopping off an extra overnight either here or in Kumasi. We reached Kaneshi District, and against early expectations, the driver drops us off on Ring Road West, 200 meters from the motor park. Auntie Abba is not pleased. Under the moonlight, I glimpse at Madam's countenance more clearly in the manner which she stretches her back and as I help her down from the vehicle. She is in her mid-70s or slightly older, most likely. The driver's in a hurry, and from behind the bus, calls out to the poor woman. On the floor of the boot, Madam's consignment consists of a basket load of plantain and other food stuff to carry home. I try to imagine her feet without a taxi, on her own in the middle of nowhere. So I ask her, how much further does she have to go? And she points to a small row of dimly lit homes in the direction of the motor park. Don't worry about me, oh. If you cross the pedestrian bridge, you will see Aboseokai. Plenty of hotels did that side. So that seems like I am sorted in terms of logistics, but I'm going nowhere without ensuring Madame's safe passage home. No, 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 no. Nete Kodi Miss Faro, we will go there together. I said to her, my name is Femi, you, you talk like a Nigerian, and she breaks off into laughter. And what? I'm laughing too. Eh, the shape of your mouth, very Nigerian. <laughs> At this point, I'm straining to balance her load on my head, adjust the rucksack on my back, and walk at the same time. It is a short distance, but long for endurance. Abba, her son, a man in his mid-40s, is waiting outside the bungalow. He sets her down on the bench before turning to help me lower the basket to the ground. His name is Ni, and he walks me through Kanese back to the pedestrian bridge. And here ends a random act of human kindness. I wave farewell to his mother, the Thursday-born angel. I'll know her definitely as Abba from now on. I'm deeply moved by her, her intuition and her spirit, but I know our paths will never cross again. Beautiful. Wow. When is this book going to be published? When I get a publisher. <laughs> oh, you're still looking for a publisher? Is it that difficult? I finished writing it uh, on, the 20, on the 31st of October, which was three weeks ago. So. Oh, it's fresh. Yes, completely. Wow. Hmm. Wishing you the best of luck with yeah, that one. Thank you. Are you trying to find a Nigerian or an African publisher, first and foremost, or, or you know, any publisher? I, I'm not fussy. I mean, okay. there are 54 chapters which explore my encounters, um, which explore other sort of themes, which to do with migration, which to do with self-discovery, which to do with addressing some of the tropes. Um, so I'm, I've got to hone it down, I've got to distill it, I've got to give it a voice which is, which is going to work for publishers and also for the readers who are going to be engaged with it. Beautiful. While you were reading, I was, what was going through my mind was one thing. Um, how do you fund this kind of adventure? Because it is extremely expensive to travel within the continent. A flight from Lagos to um, Dakar is almost $1,000. You know, you travel to Joburg, it's almost 1500 Even if you go by road, you know, we know how difficult that can be. And it's not like a walk in the park. So... How did you fund it? Um, so my side job, uh, for those of you who don't know, is that I direct opera. And we get paid quite a lot of money in opera. Um, as, as a director, I can command a fee which will last me two years, basically, um, as an independent artist. Um, theater is poorly paid, and I sometimes I could be quite fortunate as a performer to bag a role which will probably uh, set me through for a few more months too. So everything that I earn goes into 
the idea of an odyssey of self-discovery, which is the trip. And why didn't you apply for grants, for public uh, because, funding? Because I felt quite strongly, actually, uh, that grants, as we all know, is a waiting game. It inhibits the ambition. It's set against deadline. If you don't get it, you're going to have to reapply. And, you know, you've got to get on with life. And, and so, I, you know, the... the, the the grants will come, I mean, having to apply for them will come much later down the line when the musical, which is what the, 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 the whole thing's going to end up being, happens. So for everyone listening here, um, how do you go about this adventure? Um, what do you travel with? You travel with a rucksack, I think, right? Yes, who I've named Chris, as in Christopher. Okay. Columbus or Columbus? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I never thought of that. I never thought of that, no. Um, actually, I'm thinking if I was to do it all over again, I would rename my rucksack Olabisi after Ooh, Ajala. Ajala. Yes, Ajala the, travels. You know, an African you abroad. Do you want to explain to oh, the audience? Um, which is an inspiration. Olabisi Ajala is, uh, was uh, a Nigerian journalist, uh, social, it was a socialite, he was a poet, he was an actor, who got on his Vespa in the 60s and decided to hog, literally, with the rich and famous all over the world. He met the Beatles, he met, I think he met Idi Amin, he Nehru. traveled in Nehru, yeah. and he was on his Vespa, you know, and the Vespa took him everywhere. And the term, Ajala, travel all over the world, you know, I think it's Ebenezer Obey. Ebenezer Obey, yes. Ebenezer exactly. Obey. Um, he made him even more famous. Uh, and so I would rename my rucksack or ABC. So you have a rucksack. What kind of, how many items do you put? I'm being very practical here. There has to, Two be, a, there has to be a jalapia in that okay. rucksack. What else? Torch. Okay. Um, power bank? Life, life, no, no. Well, power bank. When did power bank start? No, not seven years ago. Maybe they did seven yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, didn't, I couldn't okay. afford a power bank because they were quite big then, weren't they? They were massive. So, and and actually, there was no use having a power bank or even a phone because data, data roaming. You know, you're traveling, so you really don't want to rely on the internet for anything. It's about communicating with the people. And there's no one checking on you back home. Like, is he safe? Do we need to call? Yeah, the embassy? I'll make those calls when I get to say, you know, a place where. I'm staying for the night. I'll make those calls then. But it, it was absolutely taken for granted by everyone who loved me and everyone I loved back that I'm going to be okay and fine and safe. And um, so uh, do you need the yellow vaccination card? I need a yellow vaccination card. Okay. And which got me into trouble when I lost. I lost my yellow... When I got to South, when I got to South Sudan, when I got to South Sudan, I lost my yellow fever certificate. That is the big one. And the yellow fever officer was uh, very angry. He said, why do you not have your yellow fever? You're an African man. You're carrying a British passport. You are confusing us. Where is your yellow fever certificate? You know, and he sat me down and it was the best lecture I could ever receive from a youngster who was half my age. He taught me so much about Africa in that one sitting. I mean, this guy, I no idea what he was doing at Port Health in the airport. He should be an ambassador. And um, he inspired this, this incredible officer. He inspired the first single from the musical. I know, you recorded a song, right? Yeah, because he was talking. He, he spoke to me about Africa. He spoke about, he spoke about being one people. You know, he despised the fact that I held a British passport as my insurance policy and I'm masquerading as a Nigerian. He couldn't understand. He said, he said to me, you are Nigerian, yet you are carrying a British passport. You have a Nigerian name in a British passport. You forget your yellow fever certificate. Did you think that you will turn up and you will wave your British passport and we will let you through? How ignorant are you of Thomas Sakara? Hmm. And he started naming a litany 
of all the great nationalists, you know, Nkrumah, he kept on going. And he sat me down and he said, people like you, you have children? I said, yes, I do. He said, what do you tell them about Africa when you have a British passport? <laughs> you know, and... You know, I love my British passport. I tell people when they ask me, what are you doing with a British passport? And I go, Br Britain was where I was mistakenly born. I was erroneously born in the UK because my parents were young students who met in a, you know, at work at night because they were studying at day, working at night, stacking shelves in supermarkets. You know, that's the story they told me. And, and one thing led to another and I emerged. <laughs> And that is why I say I was erroneously born in the UK, because my mother was saying, telling me that she was thinking at the time that she got pregnant, like before she got pregnant, she was thinking of packing it all in and going back to Niger because it was so cold, you know. And then, Bula. Or oh, Busa. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. yeah. Why so, wasn't um, part of your mission statement the fact that you said, okay, I want to travel with the Nigerian passport? Because it could have been possible, right? No, I travel with both because, like I said, there are some places you can get into with your British passport, visa free Mauritius, Madagascar, um, Comoros, Cabo Verde, I can oh, name them. The, you the can, Nigerian or British? British as well, okay, because oh, some of these okay. are top tourist venues and uh, cities or countries, and they let you through. And the ECOWAS we know about yeah, the Nigeria. Yeah, you can do, I travel yeah. with them both. And, you know, what happens is when you do get to the border, you become discombobulated, and you, you're trying to find the right passport, and the wrong one comes out. And they go, hey, hey no, don't put it back. Well, I'll put it on the table. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got to talk to that. Beautiful. I'd like to open the floor now for some questions. Let's start with the lady at the back and then you in front, please. Hi, good morning or afternoon now, right. Um, so I do wonder if there is a cultural perspective that defines countries beyond their boundaries and whether that would differentiate each African country from the other so that we're not the African country or the African continent with the individual countries and if countries or would-be countries like uh, Western Togoland uh, and Bazonia, here in Nigeria we've got Biafra, yes. If they were to break up, would there be like a phenomenal difference between them and the original countries they were a part of? And would you go there? When you say if they broke up, because you, you're saying they... If they became they're, they're... independent countries, yes. the, the agitation for self-actualization, if they did that, would they be phenomenally different from the countries that they were a part of? I like that question, and I'll tell you why. Um, as we all know, there are 54 constituted states that are recognized as nations in Africa, and there are probably two or three that are not. Western Sahara being one of them, Somaliland also, and I think there is one more, which I didn't get to. So it's called 5460 Africa. I actually went to all 56. I did go to Western, I went to El Ayum in Western Sahara, right? I didn't have any sort of code that I had to visit just the ones that were recognized because there was something intriguing about the ones that weren't. And Somaliland, which as you know, broke away from Somalia, it was an absolute joy going to Somaliland and recognizing the fact that actually the emancipation that they fought for was worth it because they did see themselves different, differently for reasons best known to them. And it, it, you, it, there's no sort of, I didn't feel like because I was there and it wasn't a constituted state that I would experience something far removed from being in a constituted, in fact, the more, the constituted states were even more fucked up than the non-constituted states, if you know what I mean. You know, excuse my French. But um, there is a joy in, in putting down the barriers, pulling down the barriers, as that officer lectured me at. And one Africa, one language, one currency, you know, which is the journey that we still need to get to because the, the effects of colonialism and the division 1884 is still impacting upon us in a big way. The legacy of that scramble is what 
is dictating the terms of some of those nations that feel that they need to reclaim what was theirs in the first place all those many years ago. And it's quite heartening going in and seeing how civil and how non-turbulent, you know, tranquil society can be, regardless of how you're recognized outside. Incidentally, Somaliland, out of all the, I had to get a visa to get into Somaliland, and in the UK, in London, you can walk off the street into the Somaliland uh, embassy. You can, without appointment, you walk in, they give you a cup of tea, they ask you to sit down, they ask you, why do you want to go to our country? And they're quite excited, too. They, why do you want to go to our country? You know, we're so pleased you want to go to our country. You know, and they, they, they literally celebrate your celebration of wanting to go and investigate. And you won't get that with some of the so-called um, recognized constituted states where the red tape to get in is as long as your worst enemy's arm, you know. So I think... Does that answer your question? I think I've done it, basically, is my answer. Uh, hi, Femi. Hello, James. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is about the, the inspiration for the book. Like the, did you read other texts? You know, like um, you, you talked about the guy in the, in the Vespa. Yeah. But there are other people who've been writing books, like the, uh, the Abyssinian Noba, and the lady from Ethiopia who wrote the um, Abyssinian Nomad. Ah, Maskram. Yes. Yes, yes. There's somebody like Sitle Kumalo who's done from Cape to Cairo. That's right. Uh, There's P.H. Um, Namandinia, an Indian guy who yes. traveled from India to Sweden. So I'm asking you know. if, you, if you drew any inspiration from any of those titles or so you just did Olabi Siajala is probably the, the most iconic, which I spoke about earlier on. Yeah, um, so, and of course I wanted to know about the food, you know, because you're moving around the continent. Um, um, how Very was good. the food experience? Yeah, um, I at the end of every road trip, the first thing I want to do is end up in a local restaurant and demolish their finest, regardless of what it is. And the, the, the near-death experience that I had in Cameroon, that morning when we survived the trip, um, I met a guy who was a doppelganger of my closest friend in the UK. He looked exactly like him, only that he was black. Um, and I approached him and I said, you know, you look like Wayne McGregor, who I trained with at Leeds and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, I know Wayne McGregor. <laughs> and he said, what are you doing here? And I told him that I was doing this mission and all whatnot. And he said, I'm coming from Nigeria, blah, blah, blah. Are you hungry? And I said, yes, I am. I'm absolutely famished. So he took me into a Cameroonian shack, like a buka, right? And I had the fight, he said, have you eaten, have you tasted fufu? And I've got, of course, every day I eat. He said, no, that's not fufu. The fufu you eat in Nigeria is not fufu. <laughs> so he, he ordered um, this dish. I think it's called ugali, ugali, ugali stew. And, and we demolished this mound of authentic fufu with water leaf, um, water leaf, spinach, and um, some roasted fish. In Kenya, in Nairobi, in Kitu, um, I tasted the most amazing uh, dish of rice that I've never heard of before. You hear about jollof, you hear of pilau, you hear of wolof. This was a, 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 a variation of rice which was wildly um, uh, harvested and was absolutely divine. So food hasn't been the big thing on my list, but when I do encounter them, I do, I do praise them like crazy. Hello, thank you very much. And uh, also for what you said about the lady called Abba, Abba, by the way. And my question actually has to do with language because um, a lot of West African languages especially, they are tonal, right? And it changes the meaning. So like if you say Abba, that means a stick. Abba, she's arrived, but Abba, that's Born the on Thursday. Thursday. One. Yeah. And I'm asking you this because I've had embarrassing moments where I mispronounced something. Um, I was talking to the French ambassador. I was actually in high school, and I wanted to say uh, to my teacher, who was very good, that, oh, I want to kiss you. But what I said 
was something that's done in the bedroom. That's what, what I wanted to do. And everybody turned a vivid red. So I want you to know whether in your travels you have had interesting language experiences. Well, that's a good one, right? Yes. So I'm going, to speak, I'm going to speak to that, but I'm going to speak to that as a 12-year-old who's in Nigeria for the first time. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah? yeah. Should I go do that? Ahead. Yeah, go yeah. Ahead. So, um, so one of the... I, I think I spoke earlier on about the absolute disappointment that I had as a child being told I was going on holiday, considering I was on the verge of starting secondary school, right, in the UK. So one of the perils of that decision, or dilemmas, or conflicts of that decision my parents made was the fact that on reaching Nigeria, I had to go back a year. It's called common entrance. I couldn't, they couldn't just put me into secondary school, regardless of my, my, my intellect. I had to go back, I had to go back to primary school. And I remember I was in my final year, Sacred Heart Private School, Ring Road Ibadan. Mrs. Opeke, I will love you forever. Headmistress, right? She taught Yoruba. And they were, <laughs> that particular lesson was looking at the variations and the tonal differences of the Yoruba language. So, she wrote on the board the word OKO. Please don't. Don't give it away yet. Don't give it away. She wrote OKO. Okay, even, even the way I'm saying it, OKO on the word on the on the on the blackboard. And she then said, Tell me, what does OKO? And I said that word. And I said, OKO. <laughs> And everyone in the class started laughing. Ah. <laughs> you know. And she said, can you say that again? Oko. She is a mean teacher. Now, for those of you who want to know what non-Yoruba speakers, Oko means penis. But it also, when spelt with the right accents on, could mean... Farming implement, ho. And, and, and it could also mean husband. Oko, 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 oko. Avi? <laughs> Very good. And then, is there another one? Oko, oko. Yeah, so four variations. And I think that's what she was trying to experiment. And then there's O W O, which all of you know. Owo, owo. A wo, a wo, a wo, and then there's another one, a wo, the town, yeah, a wo. So there was all those variations that I had to, to sort of meander through as a child growing up in Nigeria. And of course, because I'm not linguistically fa fantastic, I wouldn't recognize those variations in other countries, but I would have been intrigued. Um, thank you very much for sharing your experience. So I wanted to ask you, um, how were you documenting the process? Because I can imagine, you know, there's a lot going on, you know. Um, were you just soaking it in or you were writing all the way? You were taking photos, making videos. How were you documenting this rich experience? Thank you. Um, taking pictures is a, is a very dangerous thing in Africa. You know, um, I suspect there are some countries in the world that you could quite liberally pull out your camera and just you know, judiciously just take pictures, you know, really free and fair and, you know, people won't question your motives and intentions. Um, I was arrested four times before I realized that I couldn't do that in different countries, including Nigeria. Taking a picture of a statue outside the local airport, I got arrested, wow. right? Um, yes. yes, so I then started doing things in a very covert way, like I'll be walking... You're going to see some pictures, which accompanies the first track of the musical. You're going to see that in a minute. Um, but some of those pictures are selfies, and the ones that I really wanted uh, sort of freedom in capturing, I had to seek the permission of the people that I was taking pictures of. Um, so I'm doing a lot of documentation through photography, but principally I am writing this 
travelogue, which I've finished, but just needs pruning and ensuring that it's distilled down to a level that it's engaging enough for the reader. Um, How about a documentary film? The documentary will come after the musical, uh, okay. because the play has been written, the musical has been written about my endeavors, without me being the center of, you know, because it's not about me, it's about the country and the people. And so the character of Femi is actually distributed amongst a lot of other characters who are going into Africa with the same mission, okay? Um, but yeah, I think that's how I'm documenting the whole shebang. And you traveled for a seven year period, so there was this shift in technology as well, right? Yeah. You started with a camera and probably at some point you ended up using yeah, your phone, Yeah, I was using right? a JVC camcorder initially. Yeah. And then I switched to the phone because the JVC, as you know, once you pink it up, everyone can see right. that you're filming, exactly. right? So the camera is great because you're walking and you're snapping as you're walking or you're holding it. The, the good thing about camera phones now, they're also dictaphones, aren't they? So you could be, or you could be talking to someone. Sorry, I'm giving this game away. I'm sure you know it anyway. Like you're talking to someone, you're FaceTiming someone, but actually you're taking pictures and you're recording. That's what you're doing. But you're, you're, you're an actor, you're performing, you're walking along and you're going, uh -huh. yes, now, you know that key, put it under the pillow, but you're filming, you're actually filming people and you're filming your surroundings, you know. So I did a lot of that. I had to try as much as possible to be creative in capturing. And in your creative process, you always had your notebook with you and you were just yeah. scribbling? Yeah, and when you're writing in public, people think you're a professor. So I became a professor in the eyes of many people. Yeah. So no one would disturb you at Yeah, all. exactly. They say, professor, can you pay for my fare? Ah, you know, there's a lot okay. of that going on. Hi, good morning. Um, my question is really around Pan-Africanism and the level of um, disconnect between Africans and how we sort of still fail to recognize ourselves as one people and the failure that that entrenches in our communities to grow and develop. There's a, there's a phrase now making the rounds called global Africans where people like yourself, people of African descent who sort of have the benefit of both, you know, understanding other countries and Africa are doing a lot with tech, with culture, with the arts. And many are seeing them as sort of the hope of a, some sort of renaissance. Based on your travels, do you believe that they will indeed do what everybody hopes they will do, which is sort of bring Africa together? Or is that a bit of a pipe dream if we do not get locals? Um, and by locals, I mean proper people sort of living within these countries to actually understand that they are the same people and work together. Thank you very much. That's a very good question, and I will speak to that in the form, of, in a way that um, I can share with you what people expect of me. Uh, like I gave, I cited the example of the yellow fever certificate officer who was questioning why I'm traveling, feeling emboldened with my British passport as opposed to celebrating my nation, uh, my Nigerian passport. And so there are people having that same interrogating us as Africans you know, if we are ready or do we not feel it's the right time. Um, I think a few years ago there was this rumor that, um, as in Europe, they had the euro, there's going to be one currency in West Africa. It never quite happened, did it? Um, Eco or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, it, it never yeah. did quite happen, which was really disappointing. Um, but there is a movement. There's always that conversation going. And it's a conversation, that, as you probably know, I'm sure you do, that harks back to the 60s and the 50s, the Sankaras, you know, um, the Awolowas, the Unkrumas, they've, all, they've always, always, always um, sort of, Dubois, uh, Marcus Garvey, One Africa, we need that at some point. It's not gonna happen in our life, in my lifetime, it's way too short, but I think the, the, the the effects of colonialism, the legacy of colonialism, the scramble for Africa, the division of Africa has really set the continent back hugely. And in the way we live, the way we speak, the way we relate, the way we harmonize, 
it's all being fractured. And so as, a tr as an African trying to explore his Africanness traveling, I'm, I am seeing that expectation of me conforming. I go to a French colony and I do not speak French. And I don't speak French because I come from an Anglophone country. Um, and I'm being despised of for not engaging or trying to, to, to engage with them in the language that they speak. They speak. That could be quite pretty frustrating. And I think we, can, we could all look to a time when Africa will be a place where there is, the lingua franca is one, you know, despite what the disparities are, despite what co colonialism has done for us. I actually wanted to do an experiment which we can't do now because of lack of time. I wanted to put all of Africa on this stage. It's what I'm going to do eventually as one people, but maybe we should end with you wonderful people ha um, having a good look at my travels. It's a five minute clip of a video. Okay. Thank you, Sean. On that note, thank you once again, Femi. We look forward to the book. What's the title? 5460 Africa. Okay, and if there are any publishers in here, please do step forward and have a chat with Femi. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, this is a song about Africa like no other. It's about the heroes, the sheroes that have gone before, and the people, the places they've left behind. Place called home. Fifty-four sixty Africa. Jumbura. Hey. Hundreds of years to pay in. Fulani, Swahili, Luganda, Arabic, Africa. Pride our backbone. Sweat, blood, blisters abating. Africa. Smiles on our faces. A shroud in our places. One voice. 
Lumumba. We are one people, we are one people, one voice. Come on. And chanting. Time is now the fight of life uphold Africa. We are the future. We are one people, one voice. We are one people. We are one people, one Clap your hands! 